Hello and welcome to another panel session as part of the SEGA Sport Integrity Week. My name's Stuart Hodge, I'm the CEO of Football New South Wales and welcome to today's discussion on the changing landscape of sport governance and integrity, a view from down under. Such is the level of concern at the growing threat to the integrity of sport, the governments of Australia and New Zealand have both commissioned reviews in recent years. Recommendations from the Australian Review have been implemented including the creation of a single nationally coordinated organisation to address sport integrity issues in Australia. That is Sport Integrity Australia is the name of the organisation. Here we're going to discuss the challenges to sport integrity in Oceania and how the way forward might progress with Sport Integrity Australia and other concepts. The session will also explore the need for sport to appropriately address the health, safety and well-being of participants including the need to combat bullying and abuse and other threats to positive sporting experiences. On the panel today, let me introduce David Hellman, who is Sport Integrity Consultant based in Wellington, New Zealand. David is the chair of the Athletes Integrity Unit, having been reappointed to that position by the World Athletics Council in September 2019. He's also the chair of World Squash Ethics Commission, deputy chair of the International Tennis Federation Ethics Commission, and Chair of the International Cricket Council and Anti-Corruption Oversight Group. David was Director General of the World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA, from August 2003 until July 2016, and was instrumental in the shaping of WADA into a highly respected and unified global organisation responsible for regulating and monitoring world sport and world governments. Welcome, David. Good evening, Stuart. Also joining us today is Sal Perna, Sal's 47 year career of fighting crime and corruption has seen him appointed as Victoria's inaugural Racing Integrity Commissioner on March 1st, 2010. Reporting to Parliament, he provides independent oversight of integrity of the state's multi-billion dollar racing industry. And his initial appointment has been extended a total of four times. Prior to this appointment, Sal was the founder and managing director of Calibre International providing corporate consultancy services in areas such as leadership training, coaching, mentoring, staff selection, business planning, issue and incident analysis, and specialising in security risk, anti-corruption development of professional standards and the conduct of major complex investigation reviews. Prior to his corporate appointments, Sal was a commissioned officer of the Victoria Police, achieving the rank of detective inspector and the position of officer in charge, crimes courses unit, Welcome, Sal. Good evening. Thank you, Stuart. So as mentioned in the introduction, we've seen recent reviews commissioned into sport integrity by the governments of Australia and New Zealand. David, let's start with the one in Australia, which you were uh, instrumental in developing the recommendations that came out of that review. What was the catalyst behind the government's decision to conduct that particular review? Well, Stuart, the, the primary reason for it was Sandpaper Gate, the Australian cricket uh, ball controversy that took place in South Africa and led to quite a media response uh, and quite an uptake even at political level. Uh, that when attached to other issues like the engagement or involvement more of crime in, in sport uh, led to the minister uh, setting up this panel and I was fortunate enough to be one of the members. Um, Judge uh, James Wood was the chair of the panel and Ray Murley, who's well known to Sal, uh, was the other member. And we had a pretty broad brief in terms of how we were to uh, address the issue and, and obviously ended up in the report that you, that you mentioned. Thanks for that, David. And look, one of the key outcomes of the review was the establishment of Sport Integrity Australia. What was the rationale behind the creation of a, a single nationally coordinated organisation to address sport integrity issues within the country? Stuart, I think there were a number of aspects that, that led to this. Um, and in no, in no particular order, there was no real sports tribunal in Australia. Uh, sport was using the Court of Arbitration body that was established uh, during the Sydney Olympics and still had an office in Sydney, um, but that was proving a little expensive and a little hard for people to access. And there was a view, I think, consistent among 
most of the sports, at least the smaller ones, that they wanted some place to go to for their issues, which would not be uh, inaccessible in it, and not expensive. So that was one issue. Uh, and we, in our recommendations, recommended that a tribunal be established, and it has been, uh, along with a possible court of appeal in, in Australia as well. Uh, one or two of the other issues uh, were the sorts of things that have been talked about internationally now for 10 or more years. Uh, issues of corruption, issues relating to bribery of officials, matters in, in respect of anti-doping, which came under the same umbrella uh, simply because anti-doping engages the criminal underworld as well and the trafficking of the substances and so on. So you have connections with issues relating to matters that people are making easy money from. Uh, and that includes betting, uh, regulated and un unregulated betting, which sellers more accustomed to dealing with than, than I am. But they were some of the issues that came out, including the request made of us by many sports, that could we look at something which would collectively look for, on behalf of many sports at the issues they were confronting. Over the years, there have been many uh, edicts coming out of Sport Australia and other institutional bodies asked individual sports to put in place various ways of dealing with uh, some of these issues. But when you uncover an individual sport, they don't have the resource, neither financial nor human, to deal with it in the way that the protocols and policies uh, ask them to. So this was a collective response for those sports. For the ones that are in place with more money, more avenues to resolve issues like the AFL and the NRL and and Cricket Australia and so on, they are given an option to buy into the Sport Integrity Australia uh, processes and including the tribunal. Um, and we will see how it all develops with um, in, in the years to come as to how Sport Integrity will react to those sorts of issues. And I see just today in the media in Australia, there is already a new body being pulled together to look at issues relating to safeguarding and so forth as part of sport integrity. Uh, and I was fascinated to, to see that there was an instant response from the sporting bodies, including the Australian Olympic Committee and the Commonwealth Games Federation, uh, to come together to have a forum to discuss how best they were to look at uh, those sorts of issues, which are part of integrity, uh, but have not yet being addressed un under that um, Sport Integrity Australia umbrella, uh, which I should say, before I complete my long answer to your question, um, has only gone through the first stage of implementation. There are going to be several stages before it is established to the optimum, which will be the body that we had anticipated in our, in our report. And I'll come back to you on that, David, and get your thoughts around the, the future direction of Sport Integrity Australia. But Sal, your, your appointment as the Racing Integrity Commissioner also came after a, uh, a report that was published, the Lewis Report, back in 20, uh, was it 2010? That's 2008. 2008. Review, yeah. and, so, and so what was the, what was the background to, to that report being conducted and the creation of your office? Yeah, and it, I think it's, it applies to the creation of a lot of other bodies. You need a... Um, a good crisis to create major reform. Uh, and, and that's really what had happened. We, we had the, the largest of our controlling bodies with racing that had a couple of issues at the time, one around governance and, and concerning the CEO uh, making bets uh, that were undeclared uh, and one of our more notorious criminal families, uh, one of the members of that family buying a racehorse while they were in jail. So there was a couple of um, catalyst there for the government to say, well, you know, this is a $4 billion industry, uh, a very important industry. What's going on? We need to have a look at it. So they appointed uh, Gordon Lewis, who was a county court judge, had a look at it, uh, fairly wide ranging terms of reference and came back with over 60 recommendations. And one of those was that it needed an integrity oversight role to have a look at what the the controlling bodies in racing were doing when it came to 
integrity aspects. And that's why they created uh, the position that I'm in now. Is there concern that you need to have that oversight body above sports, that, that they don't have the ability to be able to sort of self-regulate in this space? Yeah, there's a, I, think, uh, I don't think there's a black and white answer to that because it depends on the, the integrity model that's applied and it, de it depends on a, a range of factors. But, but we know that either in reality or in perception, if integrity is managed by a particular organisation, there can be influence or there can be interference by senior management. Uh, and there can also be a competition, if you like, because when you've got limited income, or revenue that's coming in and you've got to allocate it to a particular uh, role and you've got integrity wanting money to do things and be resourced appropriately, but you've got advertising and sponsorship and membership, et cetera, et cetera, it could create a bit of a conflict as well. So there's that aspect of it. And there's also the other aspect of this we all develop tunnel vision in the roles that we have, the organisations we have. And it's, I think it's uh, very important to have independent and, and fresh eyes looking at something. And, you know, some of the roles that David's had with going in and reviewing sports brings that to the equation because sometimes you don't, don't see what's obvious. Absolutely. And so, David, just going back to Sport Integrity Australia, and you mentioned that this is the first phase of, of their development. What do you see as the, the next steps that are coming for that organisation? Well, I think the announcement today actually indicates one of the issues that they do need to address, and that's the issue of safety and protection of athletes and others in, in the world of sport in the same way as we protect them in society in general. So sport has an overarching role to ensure that young athletes in particular uh, are not preyed upon or groomed or abused. Uh, and that's a really big component of issues of integrity that must be addressed. And, and, and I'm not, look, I have to agree with Sal, it's got to be done by a monitor or an organisation which is separate and independent from the sports themselves. I don't think it's just a perception, Sal, I think it's actually reality sometimes where, where you know that sport feels it has to protect its own reputation. Uh, and that leads to people not being willing to go with their complaints to the sport itself. And I've asked myself uh, this question, Stuart, uh, over the last few days. Why is it that so many people feel able to complain through the media, but not through the avenues that may be established? And, and, and there are several answers to that, obviously, but one of which is they don't respect or trust the people who are in place inside sport itself to be able to share information with them for fear of uh, I can only think of one word, retribution, whether that be by non-selection or anything else, including social media abuse and so on. So we do need to work with established bodies like the Human Rights Commission, like the Child, the Commissioner for Children and, and, and those sorts of people to make sure that we're doing something in sport, which probably is mirrored already in our societies and not reinvent the wheel and not set up new services which are already available. So there's a whole combination of things that we can throw together as we go forward uh, into the second phase. Do you, do you think there's a, a particular sport or country that, that has the right model in terms of this uh, protection of their participants? Well, I'm slightly biased here, um, Stuart, because I, I chair the Athletics Integrity Unit, which was established by the IAAF then, now World Athletics, to protect its reputation, which had a hammering uh, with the Russian athletics fiasco and, and so on. And, and SEBCO uh, really generated a whole governance review of the organisation and set up an independent body, which has as its mandate, a whole spread of issues from corruption, bribery, doping, match manipulation or event manipulation, age manipulation, safeguarding and so on. So. We have a mandate which is across the board, but only at international level, relating to international athletes. And so you have to look at a trickle down from that to what might occur at national level around the world, which is a pretty difficult thing to achieve in a way which is consistent. Uh, we've done it in WADA with the anti-doping rules, uh, but I can assure you that wasn't easy. Uh, and I'm, I'm struggling to think of a way of, of implementing it in other 
in, in, in sports and in countries where it might be consistent. But that's a challenge at international level. That is a body, however, coming back to it, that does do the full spread, if you like, of, of issues that I would say were under the integrity umbrella. And Sal, so in the racing industry, obviously it's, it's important as every industry, the protection of the participants. What, what are some of the measures that you're seeing within the industry to better protect the participants that are involved? Yeah, a, a couple of things to it. Um, and one, um, just adding on to David's comments, um, the, the international models, um, tennis is another good example where they've created an independent board that has both the governing bodies, the administrators of tennis that are on that board, but also independent people who are, have no affiliation with tennis. And the structure of that has been to oversee what was traditionally anti-corruption measures, but also bringing anti-doping together under the one banner and to recognise the importance of the independence so that there are five independent people and four governing bodies. So it, it's a, quite a good model from an international perspective. But as David says, nationally, it's, it's really um, a case-by-case -case situation in, in a lot of cases because of cultural issues, political issues, et cetera. So if you look at racing in, in Hong Kong, the, the model there as far as a, an integrity model is very, very strong because they control the sport. They also control betting. And the way that they can put their integrity standards on include things like trainers having to hand their horses over under the care and supervision of the Hong Kong Jockey Club, which means the horses are stable there, they're under CCTV, they're swabbed more often, et cetera, et cetera. If you came to Australia and you said to a trainer, we're taking your horses off you, um, it, you know, you couldn't do it. <laughs> it, just, it just wouldn't happen. So. There's some aspects that are cultural and there's aspects that are political and there's examples of those as well. So the national approach is a, a little bit more difficult than perhaps a, an international approach. Um, to, to, your, to your question, um, I think most integrity bodies and people charged with the responsibility of integrity have been pretty good about what we consider the standard suite of uh, threats. So illegal gambling, uh, anti-doping, uh, match fixing, those sorts of things. But lately, it's been great to see that there's been a focus that's far, far more broader, looking at participant conduct, particip participant protection, member protection, and particularly child safety. And, um, you know, we, we had uh, not, lo not long ago, uh, Racing Victoria, for example, created a participant protection officer uh, to look after the uh, safekeeping, if you like, the safeguarding of younger participants. Um, and as you know, in racing, we have very young participants, whether they're apprentice jockeys uh, or whether they're stable hands uh, who might be working at a remote property under a particular trainer uh, and are in potentially what could be vulnerable positions. So, I'm glad to see that shift going across to those aspects. And, and as we've seen a lot of sports, um, parent behaviour has left a lot to be desired uh, with some parents getting very agitated and taking it out on the officials, the referees or other kids. Um, and integrity hasn't necessarily been a, uh, had a focus in that particular aspect, but now it is because it recognises it's far broader than match fixing, anti-doping, etc. And I'm really pleased to see that. Yeah, look, in, and within football and other sports in, in Australia, we've seen um, the issues of uh, behaviour of, of spectators and players within community sport becoming a, a significant issue within our, within our sports, uh, making headlines on an all too regular basis, unfortunately. And uh, most sports are moving to sort of a zero tolerance policy on that sort of behaviour to, to try and stamp it out. And David, just um, returning back to the, um, the Sport Integrity Australia, and the, what are some of the other recommendations that came out of your review that, uh, that you would like to see implemented as soon as possible if they haven't been already? Well, I haven't kept, kept uh, total track of, of what the new organisation has, has already encompassed, but I do gather from reading the government report that um, 
the second stage is going to include the sort of issues that Sal just discussed. And that really will lead on for, from this forum that's being established in Australia uh, right now. Um, the, the areas are wide. And, and as Sal just pointed out, we started in this area really with more anti-corruption, um, making sure that there wasn't bribery for events, making sure that the betting could be controlled as much as you could under a regulating betting market. Bearing in mind, in this part of the world, um, the amount of money that's bet in the unregulated market is huge. And the report was very careful to ensure that people in Australia were encouraged to use the regulated market if possible. And I'm, I'm sure Sal can comment more on that, rather than them to be persuaded to go offshore in an unregulated market because they had different things that they could bet on. And, and that's a challenge in the betting industry that it is not just down under, it's, it's worldwide. Uh, we in New Zealand have it. And I think last year, and, and I, I agree with Sal about the Hong Kong Jockey Club, for example, and the Asian Racing Federation, which have done some really good work in this area. They've worked out that about half the money that is bet on sport in New Zealand goes offshore into the unregulated market. About half. That's a, that's a heck of a lot. Now, how that is managed, I haven't got the answer to that because many of the betting people that are engaged in it are invisible or part of, of a organised group that uh, makes itself invisible uh, and makes it really difficult. But from that group come the people that are grooming our young people to do something silly. Uh, and they don't bet necessarily on... We, we know this. They don't bet on results and things. They might bet on whether a player goes out onto the field in a cricket game wearing a cap, for example. And, and how can you ever spot that? No matter what sort of overarching monitoring you have, it's a very difficult thing to do. So they're clever. And they're not just betting for the sake of making a lot of money. They're betting to launder the money. Uh, and I know, Sal, you've got a heck of a lot of experience in this area and you might want to comment on it. I just know from my perspective... And the work that I'm doing in cricket, for example, it's huge. And it's, and it's an area where education, training of players, training of coaches, training of parents, uh, all those aspects are really, really important. And you can't, you can't do enough. It's, there's so much you have to do. So um, those are sort of some of the things that we're going to have to confront as we go down the track with Sport Integrity Australia. But I just thought um, they sort of encompass racing as well. There are areas we, we, I know in Australia, we work alongside each other to a degree. Um, in New Zealand, it's going to be similar, uh, I hope. Sal, did you want to um, add something to that discussion? Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Um, I mean, there's a lot of great points here. We could talk about them for hours, uh, even if we just talked about betting. But there's a, a couple of really important ones that jump out for me is we, I don't think we see much in Oceania that hasn't been seen before around the world. And that, that to me reinforces the importance of something like, you know, SEGA creating a conference like this for us to get around and talk and exchange ideas and, and debate issues and whatever. And similarly, the importance of creating bodies and networks and forums that do the same thing, because predominantly we're exchanging ideas, information, advice to try to make sport a better place to be. Um, we're all after the same end game. And SIA is, is in, in my view, one of the greatest initiatives ever for a whole range of reasons. And as David said, you know, this working party that's been created where you've got uh, the Australian uh, Olympic Committee, you've got the Commonwealth Games Committee, and you've got the Paralympics all coming together. Now, that's, that's about 50 plus sports, national, international sports that have come together and said, hey, We've got to do something about protecting our, our members, our participants, and particularly the younger ones and, and making sure that codes of conduct and codes of behaviour are enforced and, and complaint handling is efficient, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great starting point. And yet, you know, that's an organisation that's only a month old. So that's, if, if that's the, the, where the energy is going and the focus is going, it can only lead uh, to greater things. Um, the betting part of it, continually fascinates me because racing in a way is kind of um, luckier 
than other sports because we've had betting associated with the sport since day one. So you don't run uh, horses and dogs around a track for the sake of it. You do it so you can bet. And that's what racing started as. And that meant that there's always been an approach to the integrity related aspects of racing. And that's meant understanding the wagering environment and how betting works. And, and that's why we've had for, for a long time now, people like form analysts and betting analysts that are able to analyze what is happening on the markets. Um, is there something suspicious? Has there been fluctuations that you can't have a, a rationale for, et cetera, et cetera, to trigger investigation and intelligence gathering, et cetera, et cetera. So we're kind of lucky from that perspective that we've, been able to do that. Um, in the past, we've relied on stewards to do it. Um, stewards, of course, can read a race and whether there's been a, uh, a breach of a rule, but that doesn't automatically make them an expert intelligence officer, an expert investigator, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been very unfair to stewards to give them that accountability to do all of that. And, and that's why so many uh, sports and so many integrity units have now got those sorts of experts on board, which I think is a wonderful thing. Um, and how we access data and how we get that from the wagering providers is a whole other issue. But the, the last point I'll make is it's a massive, massive industry in itself because, you know, I, I don't know what David's figures, uh, what he can remember going back, but I can remember uh, reading an article, a study that, and I don't know whether it came out of Interpol or someone that said that uh, the illegal market's worth about a trillion dollars. And I didn't know what a trillion dollars was. I, I had to actually Google what that amount meant and I was blown away by it. But nowadays, you know, I can, I can tell you, for example, uh, in Greyhound Racing in Victoria just last year, there was over $2 billion bet. Now, that's just Greyhound Racing, just in one state, just in one country. So that, that gives you a perspective of how big this is and how we control that, how we regulate that, how we investigate that. That's the key question because there is this... I guess, caution about over-regulating it, forcing it to go into the black market so we can't see anything and we have no idea of it, or do you let it go to a certain extent and then do you, how do you get involved? And, and that's a challenge not only for integrity, but it's a challenge for government because government has got some powers, particularly with you know, telecommunication uh, legislation where they can close down websites and other things, but what happens then? Do they just start another one and off you, off you go all over again? So, it's a question we could talk about or, or debate for, for days. Yeah, absolutely. A significant issue that continues to, to challenge sport. David, we'll, we'll turn our attention to your home country, New Zealand, um, and the, the review that's been going on for, for some time into sport integrity there. Can you give us a little bit of background as to what, what sort of triggered that to commence and, and what its current status is? Well, I hope I can. And look, it started in, in 2016 with a full review, not triggered by uh, a nasty example of something, but more triggered by the way in which the world was working towards uh, establishing integrity bodies and units. Uh, and there was a lot of research done. Uh, there have been a lot of reports written. In, in about the middle of 2017, they said they weren't quite ready to put into place a unit integrity unit because there was a risk they could over engineer their response um, and then did more reports and did some research and then toward the end of 2019 uh, issued a quote report unquote which established about 22 different aspects that they wished to then do further work on before they reached the conclusion. Now you might call this procrastination, you might call it delay, you might call it lack of leadership, but nothing has happened in, in, in the space that perhaps should have. And there's an opportunity that was given through some of the sports being investigated on, a, on an individual basis. I think about nine different sports now have had issues that I would describe as integrity issues over the last two or three years, um, but there hasn't ended up being a monitor. And, and I, I, I got to come back to that. There are lots of good protocols and policies out there you know, lots of rules, um, but to have, have good rules, you need good people and then you need good leaders and then you need, like Sal, good monitors of those rules to make sure, one, they're implemented and two, they're practiced. And three, if they're not, 
with an avenue for people to go through to check them out and make sure that they are some form of compliance or some form of complaint. And at the moment, there's nothing here. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at a gymnastics review, which I've been entrusted to undertake. Um, there wasn't anything in place to do that. More is the pity. I can't comment it, obviously, because I'm in the middle of it. But if you look around the world, you'll see there's a similar review being done in Australia. There's one being done in the UK. There's one being done in Canada. And this seems to me to be, again, an opportunity for the world to unite a wee bit better. So coming back to one of the comments that Sal made about how can we do some of these things internationally so that we can share information and share information on a legal issue as well. And, and there are some avenues. There's the Macklin Convention in relation to fixing of sport, which Australia is, is, is a signatory. New Zealand is not. Um, and that enables the enforcement agencies to share information among the European enforcement agencies, that's really important because some of the stuff that comes out of that might lead to the arrest or apprehension of someone who's trafficking in steroids, for example. It, it's across, it goes across the whole avenue of enforcement and we don't have that in New Zealand yet. So we, we are sort of a wee bit behind, uh, which disappoints me, but I've just got my fingers crossed as to going forward, Stuart, that might change and when we follow the sort of example that Australia has set. You, you mentioned that you know up to nine sports have gone through their own individual reviews on sport integrity issues. You know, is, is there not, I guess, a, 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 an obvious solution there to potentially follow the Australian model, considering that all of these sports have gone through their own reviews and, and you know, there's, there's a, a neighbouring country right nearby that's... Uh, perhaps set a model that New Zealand can follow? I, I, don't, I don't know why they haven't actually got together with some of the officials in Australia talked about that. Uh, the research project, which was published last September, doesn't even mention the Wood Review, or might make one re reference to it, but it doesn't reference it in terms of the issues that it, 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 it addressed. And so, so, you know, this happens sometimes. Um, people like to reinvent the wheel themselves uh, and and that's really just what is what has occurred it just seems to me to be a waste of energy and a waste of money uh, which could be properly spent in other areas and, and just while I'm saying that Stuart I just it just run across my mind another thing many of the athletes that are affected by these sorts of things are not paid athletes they're what we used to call amateurs or, or doing it for for the sole purpose of going to the Olympic Games or, or whatever. And they may be funded to a degree by the government and maybe some help from their sport. They have nowhere to go as a collective group unless there is a players association formed to look after them. And if that were formed, who's going to fund it? Because these are athletes who don't have the money to pay dues like you might get in, in Australian football or... or, or any other form of football that you have in Australia because there are players associations that are very effective. We need also to think of the health and welfare of those kids and make something available to them. And I guess it's the same cell for jockeys and, and, and you know, in your industry where they do need, and I think they've got it, uh, a collective voice and a way of doing things where they're not picked on if they, if they speak out. So that's another thing I just thought I, I wanted to um, squeeze into the conversation. If so, I'll, I'll touch on that with you in terms of participant associations and, and their role within sport to support the wellness of, of their um, participants. As, as David said, you've got some very well-established uh, athletes and, and participant unions um, and associations that are working hard to protect their, their, um, their participants. But you do have those ones that, that, that don't exist, uh, especially as, you know, for the, for the amateurs and, and those that are that are doing it to represent their country? And um, how do you see that sort of within the, the racing industry? Yeah, it's, uh, um, it's, it's hard to find a particular reason why that, that happens, whether it's embedded in a, a policy or a process or it's a psychological or, or human factor. Um, I don't think it's that far back where you'd have a, a governing body that wouldn't care what anyone else thought about something that they were going to implement because 
they're the guardians of the sport. They're going to do it because in their minds, this is what you do. But that's slowly and slowly shifting away um, to recognising that that consulting phase of policy development is absolutely critical and the stakeholder engagement that goes around that. So racing is a good example where you've got jockeys that must go through a policy and process about becoming licensed. And that includes a, a very strong training program. But part of that training program includes integrity. So I go to every jockey training program when they're in the first year, second year, third year and fourth year to reinforce what integrity is all about, what's important. And, and it's not so much about things that, that stewards would do about explaining the rules and what happens when you breach them and the disciplinary process that sits around them, but it's about what integrity really means and particularly the impact it can have on you from a livelihood perspective and from a reputational perspective as a person. Um, and I think that's a really good example of where that engagement, that consulting has been brought together because the, the Jockey Association recognises that being a jockey is more than just being able to ride a horse. It, it's much more broad. It's about being a good person, etc. And, and that's, that's the part that frustrates us, people like David and I, because when you watch and read reviews and you find that really it's been created for a particular reason, you're not sure sometimes what that reason is, um, and it ends up being the same thing. It's just going over the same stuff, looking at all the, the risks, uh, getting feedback from people and coming out, essentially what is being discovered before. There's very rare that you pick up a piece uh, of uh, a review and look at it and go, wow, that's mind blowing. I've never seen that before. So for example, and you know, Stuart, we've got new sports governance uh, principles that have been issued in the last few weeks. They're a really good base document to have a look at what governance in sport should look like. Now, I know there's a little bit of, uh, not jealousy, but, um, you know, uh, oh, we don't need to look at them. Uh, what would they know? And we know better and whatever else. But be, be kind of nice to save money and time and just look at what others have done and see whether that, that fits and start from there without having to start from scratch. And that's about what you're talking about, about consulting and engaging because everybody's got a story to tell. Um, you know, I, I always am fascinated by organisations that, that create policy and process without talking to the people who are going to implement it. I don't understand that. You know, it's just, you know, I can remember Bob Ansett years ago making all of his managers sit behind the desk at the rental office to be there, to fill in the forms, to engage with the customer, to take their payment, to give them the car just so they knew the effect of what decisions they made uh, and how they worked at the workplace. What a great example. And that's why I think some sports are really good where officials mingle and they go to the sport and they don't necessarily go to the sport to, to socialise, but they go to the sport to watch what is actually happening on court, on field and behind the scenes. And the things that they've implemented, are they working or not? Because it's okay for us to, to say, you know what, you need to have a fit and proper person test before you license a participant. And great, we've got it. But when you look at it, it doesn't work because no one ever follows up when someone <laughs> does a check or a check comes back with a positive and no one ever makes a judgment on whether that person still is fit or proper. But no, no, we, we did it. We did it. We had a police check and, and we got it back. So we ticked off the policy. So if you engage with people, you find that out. And if you ask for people to, to be involved in that decision-making, you're always going to end up with a better product. Absolutely. And I, I see, David, you're in, you're in agreement with that from, uh, from your reaction. And I guess it goes back to what you were talking about earlier about, you know, international bodies setting certain um, procedures that need to be followed going down into the, the, the national landscape. But it's very difficult to find a one-size-fits-all especially when you've got very global sports? Look, it's almost impossible to find a one-size-fits-all, although the World Anti-Doping Code is that. Um, there have been a lot of complaints that, you know, it doesn't work properly for athletes at a certain level and, and so on. Um, those debates will continue to occur. What you have to do with the Anti-Doping Code is say, 
um, well, it was unique, uh, and and I don't want to look for any any sort of applause, but doing something unique and getting into place means it can be done in other ways as well. The key at the end of the day is just what Sal said. You can have all the good rules, all the good processes, but you've got to have good people, and you've got to have good people practicing, implementing, and monitoring. And I emphasize the last part because there's very little of the latter. We issue out all these pages I, just to research for this session. I've looked at a couple of things. Pages and pages of really good policies. Lovely reading. Who's actually followed up on it? And who's injected the right people into the right position so that we can say, we've got really good people. All those things need to be done and can be done if you've got an overarching monitor of the integrity that, that um, Sal was mentioning. And I think that's possible. Uh, we do have processes in other parts of our society where that takes place. Uh, why can't we do it in sport? Absolutely. So just going back to the Lewis report in 2008, looking back on all of that now and, and what you've achieved since then with, within the office and, and implementing those recommendations, what, what's your sort of evaluation now of, of where you know, the integrity of racing is at compared to where it was back in those times? Yeah, that, a, a, a good question, Stuart. Um, the, just as a, a base to, the, to, to my answer, number one, it was a, a government commissioned um, review. So that's, that's always a good thing from my perspective because you know that a, a government is in turn for a particular period and you know that they've got to deliver on that. It can't be something that if, in some case, if you're doing it internally, it wouldn't matter whether you ever ended up finishing it or not. But because it was implemented by government, it required legislation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it was something that you knew was going to end at a particular point. The other point was in Victoria, we're pretty lucky because we've actually got a minister with a dedicated portfolio for racing. So that puts a key focus on the sport. So we've been lucky with all the ministers that, that have been in um, government since I've uh, done this job, have all been very strong supporters because they know what it contributes to the economy in terms of dollars. They know it employs 100,000 people. They know it's important, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, all those recommendations were implemented. So from there, it was a case of monitoring. The, the interesting part is when you bring in that, that human dynamic is you're creating a body that didn't exist before that's now looking over your shoulder. So no one likes that. No one likes someone looking over your shoulder to see what you're doing when they're an outsider, number one, and two, they're not racing related. So, you know, we're running the sport. We know what the sport's about. So what do you know about it? Like, who are you to tell me what to do? So that's where that consultation, that engagement, that relationship development is so critical because finding out about what you're actually doing and working with the people that are there that are creating the, the, the controls over sport are critical. And as I look back at the journey of all of the audits that we've done, the reviews that we've done, the investigations we've done, the complaints handling we've done, and, you know, as, whether it's as minor as creating a whistleblower provision for people to, to pass on information or whether it's as major as having a strategic plan for the organisation that has an integrity component. Those sorts of things are in place. And what we've got now is three very professional integrity units within the three organisations that have got experts there that can uh, look at the intel side, the investigation side, the betting analysis side. They've got modern technology through surveillance and um, use of uh, technology like drones. It, they're very well advanced and the best part for me is it's no longer reactive. They don't have to wait for something to happen. They don't have to wait for a complaint. They don't have to wait for someone to tell them something. They're proactive. They're looking, they're analysing, they're educating, etc., etc. So that for me is a, what I consider a, a fairly well-developed uh, integrity approach. Oh, that sounds great, Sal. Terrific achievements over the years. David, um, looking ahead into the future, what do you see as the, the, the next challenges that are coming for sport integrity? Well, 
it's something I raised, I think, about 10 years ago, Stuart, and that is trying to get um, an international approach to it and trying to get people around the world to understand that if they did cooperate internationally, there would be far more fair play, if you like, uh, in the way that Sal just described has been introduced into the racing industry in, in Australia. Uh, it, it, it's not rocket science. A lot of this is personal interaction, personal discussion, and establishing some form of organisation where people know exactly what their job is and able to transmit it to the people who are affected and engage those people in the whole process. So it's not it's not beyond comprehension. At the moment, it seems to be beyond international sport um, involvement because bodies like the IOC and, and, and so on don't feel that it's necessary. Some of that might be patch protection or control or, or whatever you would like to describe it. Um, but when you look now at Rule 50 of the IOC rules and the protest movements that are taking place, which don't forget took place in 1968 in Mexico, they are now coming back. How are we dealing with those social issues in a way that makes a lot of sense? And how are we dealing with the minds and, and ideas of the athletes who are impacted and affected where we can use that energy to, to, to really embrace sport in a, in a, as a part of society that it is. Those are the sort of challenges that I think are really out there now. They're right in our faces. We should do something about it. And Sal, were your thoughts on the, the future challenges and threats to sport integrity? Yeah, I think um, if, if you look at uh, from, I guess, the, the micro uh, view at any sport, um, I think there's two things that are, that are there. And, and this is aside from the ones that always be there, like, you know, manipulation and illegal gambling, use of prohibited substances, et cetera. And, and that's that, what we've talked about, the wellness side of it, the OC health and safety side of it, the bullying, harassing, you know, um, uh, junior participants, vulnerabilities, that, that part, is, every sport should be really, really looking at that and what they've got in place to do that. The other one that, again, from that micro level for me is the use of social media because that's getting worse. We've seen it in professional sports where uh, people are attacking officials, referees, umpires, et cetera, et cetera. And now they're starting to attack the participants um, through social media and the trolling that's going on. And, and that's having mental health outcomes as well. You know, and this is in some case precipitated by someone having a bet on a player doing something and then the player doesn't do that or perform a particular way that they've bet on that day and all of a sudden they're attacking the player for it. So the wellness thing, the, the social media things are there, the current threats that need to be addressed. If you're looking about the, the bigger picture and where people should be looking to, I would say the question they've got to ask themselves is, do they have any focus on integrity in, this, in that sport? And you can see that pretty quickly because if integrity as such is not even seen on an organisational chart or in a strategic plan, I think that organisation's got an issue because what, they, what don't they know? That's number one. Number two is if they've got it in their structure somewhere, but it belongs to someone in HR uh, or um, legal or media or somewhere, well, I don't think that's, a, that's a, uh, an appropriate uh, focus on it because it needs its own focus. It needs an integrity unit person, depending on what sort of organisation, that can do all the things that we've spoken about, proactive and reactive. And I think that's the biggest question for the future. Are sports going to understand that from a governance perspective, integrity is critical because directors on boards of all organisations have got fiduciary duties. And part of that is having a risk management appetite. And part of risk is integrity risk. So if they haven't got that on their radar, I think there's, there's something wrong. Absolutely. Now to finish off, I want to ask you both about what you see the potential impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on sport integrity. And, and Sal, if I, if I start with you, how have you seen it impact 
uh, your ability to, to monitor the racing industry in Victoria? What, what impact has it had? Yeah, uh, another good question. Um, we, we're kind of lucky in a way, Stuart, because last year we did an audit of the three racing codes and had a look at all of their integrity systems and processes, the whole lot, almost like a stock take. What do they have in place? What's working? What's not? And that was pre-COVID. So the aim for the next financial year is to do a post-COVID audit and then compare the two. So what, what were they doing beforehand? Are they still doing it now? So for example, resourcing. Have they lost positions because of the revenue that's been affected? They've had to make people redundant or were they redeployed, as we know some were, into compliance roles, ensuring COVID uh, limitations were, were put in place and people were working to them, have they then been redeployed back into integrity roles? So they're the things that we're going to look at. Uh, for us personally, as an office, uh, we haven't been able to go to a race meeting. Uh, we've been working from home, I think it's 24 weeks this week. And apart from the, uh, the interest and the excitement of going to a race meeting and watching all the integrity systems and processes, which which probably to layman sounds really lame, but it's fascinating to watch swabbing. You know, how do they take blood? How do they take urine? Uh, what's the chain of custody with that? How do they identify an animal? Um, is, is it done manually or is it done through technology? How do you know people aren't swapping a dog or a horse? All those things, being at the track and watching that and interacting with the racing participants and the officials, particularly the stewards, it, we get a lot out of that, but we haven't been able to do that. So that's been one of the um, the disadvantages of the period. And we're hoping that that will be restored and we're hoping that the standards we've got in place before COVID will be the same after COVID. And to you, David, do you, do you see some threats from COVID-19 that, uh, that will impact upon sport integrity? Well, I think if I can answer that in, in, uh, in two tranches, uh, Stuart, the, the first is that COVID has given us the opportunity to have these sorts of discussions and conversations. And I would hope they don't just fall on deaf ears and, and they do end up in, in outcomes. Um, one of the, my worries is the, the helicopter approach to discussions where the helicopter stays up in the sky and doesn't land. I'd like to see these issues landing and being dealt with during the time that we have now to really sit around the table in, in one way or another and and work them through. So that's number one. Number two, um, this has given a big opportunity to people to change from their customary sporting activities. And I mention this in a big way, eSport has blossomed. And with eSport, not only has it blossomed, it takes with it the issues of integrity that I'm sure Ian Smith will talk about when he speaks during this conference, but they are the same sort of wellness issues that Sal and I have talked about today. So you're looking at the health and welfare of the, of the athletes, you're looking at grooming, you're looking at betting, you're looking at the organised crime engagement, you're looking at almost everything just in one small new component. And it's new because it's not run in the same way as our traditional sports. They're privately owned games that can be privately run. So we've got another real challenge in terms of how is that managed governance-wise what are governments going to do about it? What are the players doing about it? What are the owners of the various games doing about it? So there's a lot of stuff there that I think provides a challenge. And then you come back, finally, to these same old things. Betting on anything. We saw in this country betting on Ukrainian senior B table tennis during COVID because that was the only live sport. Uh, and that was fixed. Then we saw... Uh, other activities that were, were, were going on, which were not, I would say, falling into the wellness category or the integrity category, um, just because we were frustrated. We didn't have anything to do. Um, doping has probably gone on during it, for example. And we who are involved in the anti-doping program have got to be aware that the opportunity was provided to those athletes who see doping as a way to success down the track. And the final thing is we've got to start assuming that when we get back from COVID, what we go to is not what we had before. 
because there are going to have to be changes, obviously, at least in the next 12 months or so. And we've got to get used to those. And some of that will mean not as much money going into sport. So what will be available will need to be shared around in a, in a, in a different way. David and Sal, thank you very much for your time. Great, insightful conversation. Uh, look forward to seeing, uh, seeing you again and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for uh, your participation. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you.